Hi, my name is Connie McGuinness and you're watching the video titled Introduction to Differential Diagnosis. In this video, we actually have a very narrow focus on the differential diagnosis between congenital and recent or acquired neurogenic palsies and looking at the distinction between neurogenic palsies and mechanical restrictions. So we're not exploring differential diagnosis in general terms, but rather specifically in relation to neurogenic palsies. So the focus of this video will be looking at congenital versus acquired. And as we talk about congenital versus acquired, we're also uh, talking about long-standing versus recent. So keep this in mind that um, congenital long-standing deviations often have various similarities. There are some uh, distinctions between the two, but obviously um, a long-standing deviation will demonstrate some features that a congenital deviation will have because of its long-standing nature. Okay, and we'll also look briefly at neurogenic uh, palsies versus mechanical restrictions. However, we will be reiterating this as we move into the modules related to mechanical uh, restrictions. Okay, so here we have a table that distinguishes between congenital and acquired deviations or long-standing versus recent. And these are from Ansons and Davis. And what we can see here is firstly the history. Uh, an indication will be made around what part of the history could indicate that this is either a long-standing problem or a congenital problem. And generally speaking, patients with congenital deviations or long-standing deviations will present to you due to the appearance of the deviation or the abnormal head posture. And generally, because it's been there for a long time, diplopia is not as bothersome or it may be intermittent. With congenital deviations, they also are unfamiliar, or the patient's unfamiliar with onset and may not be able to give you an indication as to when they first uh, noted that there may be a deviation abnormal head posture or a um, um, diplopia and so forth. With acquired pauses, on the other hand, the primary complaint is usually diplopia. It may obviously also be that they've noticed that their eye is turning, but uh, they will be very distinct in indicating that they have double vision as compared to the congenitals or the long standing where it's not as bothersome. And usually with acquired neurogenic pauses, the timing or the onset is quite well known. Because it's recently acquired, the history is quite exact as to when the patient first noted the double vision or the eye turn. In terms of abnormal head postures, the patient who's acquired will also usually be quite aware that they need to put their head in a particular position to gain BSV. However, the congenitals in particular are not often aware of their abnormal head posture. You might have to ask the patient, for instance, to go into the family album test or bring out images of when they were younger so that you can decipher whether what you're observing in clinic has been there for a long time. Also, because if it is a long-standing uh, deviation or congenital, what you can find is that there can be contraction of neck muscles and scoliosis. So this is also another indication that the patient may have a long-standing or congenital problem. Another um, thing you may notice, which is difficult because this will often be dependent on the size of the deviation, but um, the abnormal head posture may be smaller than expected in the um, congenital patients. And this comes back to what we'll see in a moment where their fusion ranges are larger or often larger. And therefore their uh, area of BSV is larger and therefore their abnormal head posture can be smaller. Now, with a constant abnormal head posture, what can happen is that a facial asymmetry may develop. So a patient who's had a congenital um, incompetent strabismus and has adopted an abnormal head posture could develop some facial asymmetry. When it's acquired, generally this doesn't happen.
In terms of ocular movements, we've discussed a number of times that with time, the deviation becomes concomitant. So in long-standing congenital deviations, we're expecting to have difficulties deciphering the difference between the primary and the secondary deviation. And this will be the same on the HES chart where the, the, um, the fields of the HES chart will be relatively similar in size. And again, it'll be difficult to diagnose the primary effect in muscle because of the concomitancy of the deviation. So in contrast with acquired deviations and recent, uh, with a recent onset, we're expecting that we might see a muscle sequelae or we may simply see the overaction of the contralateral synergist. And we should be able to see on the HES chart a distinction between the primary and the secondary deviation and the secondary deviation should be greater than the primary, both in ocular movements or in cover testing, I should say, and also on the HES chart. Okay, if you perform forced duction testing with congenital deviations or long-standing deviations, you may expect that the uh, ipsilateral antagonist may have contracture, in which case you will get a positive FDT uh, on examination. In a recently acquired deviation, you won't find that this is the case, bearing in mind that if it's acquired but long-standing, contracture will occur. Okay, in terms of fusion amplitude, I mentioned just a moment ago that often with congenital deviations and sometimes with very long-standing deviations, the fusion range, particularly the vertical fusion range, can be extended beyond the normal. So where we're usually expecting that the fusion range or the vertical fusion range will be around two to three diopters, you may be surprised to find that a patient has a vertical fusion range of 10 doctors or more. This is usually an indication that a patient had a congenital deviation. So as we said earlier, the abnormal head posture is often small. This is because the field of BSV is often large due to these larger fusional amplitudes. So in contrast with the acquired deviations, we're expecting a smaller area of BSV. Again, you have to bear in mind that some of these will be dependent on the extent of the palsy and the extent or the size of the deviation will bear um, or will have an impact on the, the size of the field of BSV. In terms of suppression, in order to develop suppression, we know that this has to occur during childhood. And so where you find suppression, uh, it's likely that this patient had this deviation um, or had a congenital deviation or has had a long-standing deviation, one that uh, was present whilst a child. In terms of recently acquired post-critical period, you're, you're looking at um, suppression being absent. Following on from this, you may expect to find amblyopia in patients who've had a congenital deviation or one that extended into childhood as opposed to those who, are, who developed the um, incompetent strabismus post-critical period, they won't have amblyopia. As I mentioned a moment ago, in terms of diplopia, usually diplopia will be absent or intermittent, and it's, it's not often the primary complaint of why they come to see you. As compared to the acquired or recent um, deviation, these are usually patients who present with a complaint of diplopia. In terms of torsion, and when we're saying torsion in this particular instance, we're talking about the image or subjective torsion or the appreciation of subjective torsion. This is rarely reported in patients with congenital deviations as compared to acquired deviations. Patients may indicate that they notice um, a tilted image. Okay, and finally, we have a phenomenon called pass pointing, which is absent in congenital or long-standing deviations, but present in acquired or recent um, deviations, and particularly when it's recent. Okay, what is pass pointing? I'll just take you through this because uh, I know we haven't discussed it in clinical investigations of incompetence to business. And we haven't discussed it because it's actually not a test commonly performed in clinic, but it's worth noting because occasionally you may be interested in testing this in a patient that you want to document is, is certainly a recently acquired 
uh, neurogenic palsy. So here we have an image of a patient uh, from a textbook from Von Lauren and Campos. And what we're doing here is we're occluding the fixing eye and we're asking the patient to point to a particular target. And in this particular example, what we have is a patient with a lateral rectus palsy and specifically the left lateral rectus palsy. Now in the image over here, the patient is looking into dextroversion. And so the patient is using the medial rectus of this eye to move into this position, which is not the pausing muscle. And we can see that the patient can actually point to the target accurately. And we can see here that a piece of paper has been uh, utilized here to obstruct the patient's view, as what we'd like to do is uh, not allow the patient to utilize the visual cue where the target is. The other thing you want to ask the patient to do is point to that relatively quickly. You don't want them to slowly approach the target and try to make corrective movements to accurately point or touch the target of interest. Okay, when we move over here into LAVO version, we're asking the patient to now utilize their paretic muscle, the left lateral rectus. And what will happen is that additional innovation will be going to this muscle to uh, allow it to abduct and what happens is that the excessive innovation to the lateral rectus will cause pass pointing, will cause the patient to point past the target. There is some controversy as to whether this is the mechanism as to why pass pointing occurs, but in general, um, most consider that this is the most likely reason as to why pass pointing occurs. We also see the pass pointing here in prior position, and again, this is because in prior position, we're asking the patient to abduct the eye. They would have had an esotropia because of the unopposed medial rectus as the patient is abducting the eye to bring it into prior position more innovation is going to that lateral rectus and therefore pass pointing will also occur in prior position. Now, a note that this really only occurs in recently acquired deviations. And sometimes this will be present within the first several days of acquiring the neurogenic palsy. If you reassess a patient, say in six weeks or six months or in a year, patients will no longer demonstrate pass pointing. This is one of the reasons it's not used commonly in clinic, as there's other ways to determine if a patient has had a recently acquired uh, neurogenic palsy. Okay, now we'll move now on to neurogenic versus mechanical palsies. And in the uh, first inquiry where we talked about clinical investigations, I've often talked about some distinctions between neurogenic and mechanical palsies. Here we have a table or a couple of tables that uh, list some of the common features or the differences between the two. We will come back to this when we start talking about deviations that are mechanical in nature. Okay, just quickly in terms of the deviation, the deviation in neurogenic palsy can be marked. Obviously, this will be dependent on the extent of the palsy. Where you have a minus four, for instance, you're expecting a large deviation. This, however, doesn't necessarily happen in mechanical restrictions. You might have marked limitation in elevation or depression, for instance, but in prime position, you may see little deviation. This is usually an indicator that you have mechanical restriction rather than neurogenic. In terms of diplopia, the diplopia remains relatively consistent in neurogenic palsies. So if you have, for instance, a right on left in primary, it should be a right on left in all positions of gaze. And there are some exceptions to this rule, and we'll see this in third nerve palsies and bilateral fourth nerves. But generally, in most instances with an isolated muscle uh, palsy, you should find that the deviation remains consistent in all positions of gaze. Mechanical restrictions, however, often show reversal of the deviation. Say, for instance, you have a right on left in up gaze and then a left on right in down gaze. With neurogenic palsies, if a patient develops an abnormal head posture, 
they often demonstrate a head tilt. However, mechanical restrictions usually just have chin ups or chin downs. Tilting is quite rare in mechanical restrictions because of the nature or what's causing the deviation of the double vision. As you should be aware by now, in, in terms of ocular movements, ductions are greater than versions in the neurogenic palsy, but in mechanical restrictions they are uh, relatively the same. Also, if you observe the movement um, or the cessation of movement, it's usually relatively gradual in neurogenic palsies, but can be abrupt in mechanical palsies. The other thing to note is where you find limited eye movements, that with neurogenic pauses, these can be in tertiary positions, such as labo depression or dextro depression. However, it's unlikely with mechanical restrictions that you'll find, or it's less likely that you'll find it in a tertiary position. Usually it will affect elevation, depression, or abduction, adduction. It doesn't tend to be isolated to um, a specific tertiary position. In terms of the HES chart, with the mechanical restrictions, we'll see a narrowing of the HES charts as we've seen in um, previous videos. And so that outer field will be very close to the inner field, as opposed to neurogenic, where there's much more proportional spacing between the inner and outer fields. A couple of features that we haven't discussed so far that relate to mechanical restrictions are retraction of the globe, pain on movement, and intraocular pressure. Where there is a mechanical restriction, you may note retraction of the globe, pain or movement, or an increase in the intraocular pressure when looking away from the site of the mechanical lesion. Okay, this does not occur in neurogenic palsies, and so we can look for these things if we need to, to distinguish between neurogenic and mechanical palsies. And finally, you should be familiar with these final three uh, distinctions. The forced duction test should be negative when you have a neurogenic palsy and positive if you have a mechanical restriction. The fourth generation test will be positive for neurogenic and um, negative for mechanical. For saccadic eye movements, we'll see reduced velocity for neurogenic versus uh, mechanical, which will be normal. That brings us to the conclusion of this video. I would just like to make a point that this is a very narrow focus on differential diagnosis, but important that we understand some of the key features that differentiate a patient from having a neurogenic palsy uh, as compared to a mechanical restriction or trying to work out whether this is congenital or long-standing versus acquired or recent. Please also note that to some extent, some of these are a rule of thumb. There can be exceptions to the rule or some of these features are dependent on the extent of the palsy or the extent of the limitation of the movement. So where possible, I've tried to indicate where those exceptions are, but the, these tables may not be reflective of all exceptions. So as a clinician, you will need to assess each patient case by case and have a look at their overall findings to make a conclusion or come to a conclusion as to whether this is neurogenic or mechanical uh, or whether it's congenital versus acquired or long-standing versus recent. Okay, thank you for watching.